Hello and welcome back to The Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian and, as always... With Mike as well. And together we're rereading the Aubrey Matcherin novels by Patrick O'Brien. Before we get started on a new novel this week, let's just look back at where we got to. Mike, we finished up HMS Surprise last week. Where would you say we had got to? Yeah, it, we as last we left our heroes... Um, we had sort of a crushing disappointment for Stephen uh, as as they got to Madeira and uh, Diana had had clearly run off with Mr. Johnson of America. That's doubly crushing to lose your girl and to lose him to an American. <sighs> oh my gosh, that's oh <laughs> poor man, poor man, and a colonial. My God, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, but you know, Stephen got his stoic act together and seemed to be pressing on and was trying to console Jack for having not seen Sophie there at Madeira as well. But lo and behold, they run into Henage Dundas uh, with the English fleet. Sophie is aboard. Jack and Sophie are together. Sophie is committed to marry Jack as soon as they reach land and get her mama's blessing, which she says will be not withheld. Here. And so, once again, we end on, you know, perhaps not as happy a note as always, but for Jack, a very happy note. He's got his freight money coming from the East India Company. He's going to be out of debt, can live on land, get his tidy little cabin and start growing his cabbages as he's been dreaming about doing. But, you know, we, we've got, we've been trained by O'Brien to say, oh my gosh, there's always some big reversal at the beginning of the next novel. So I guess we're waiting to find out. Is there a big reversal for Jack here? That's the big question on everybody's mind. And this week, we're going to take a look at life ashore, married life for Jack and Stephen and the rest of the, uh, some of the rest of the extended Williams family. And not surprisingly, there's going to be a, a new mission, a new assignment for Stephen and Jack. So Mike, it's interesting. We've been reading kind of hungrily from one book to the next and we've been super deeply invested in the characters and following where they are and their triumphs and their setbacks and we've kind of turned every page turned over into every chapter with great speed and i think we've both done the same as many readers do going straight from hms surprise into the mauritius command clearly from post captain surprise it was almost as if we just turned the page to the next chapter Definitely, o- almost the, the and the fo- and the following day there was there was new stuff. Exactly, but I, it's clear that that's not happened. For, first of all, let's let's go back into the world of Patrick O'Brien for a minute. Um, HMS Surprise was published in 1973, having had the first novels in fairly rapid succession, and I I don't know what passed in the four years between the publishing of HMS Surprise and the publishing of the Mauritius Command, but there was those four whole years. It was 1977. And if I've got my timing right, Mike, I think that the clock has wound forward for Stephen and Jack as well. Yeah. Oh my gosh, tremendously so. I mean, you know, whether you're whether you're following the arc of Stephen and Jack and their emotional highs and lows and, you know, their family lives, or you're following history, my gosh, we've jumped way forward here. So, you know, all of a sudden we come in and I'm kind of wondering where I landed. Some readers have said that uh, the first chapter of the Mauritius Command actually echoes a lot of Alice in Wonderland. And and I thought maybe I had fallen down the rabbit hole <laughs> here because all of a sudden, Jack and Sophie are married, not only married, but they have mm-hmm. twin babies. Uh, we don't even know how old they are, maybe a year, maybe less. Um, you know, perhaps we might assume that that they've been married for two years. Stephen, we know, has been traveling in Spain, and we don't even really know if they've been ashore the whole time or they've been out together and back, because the text sort of refers to Jack and Stephen knowing each other for, quote, many, many years. And that kind of suggests a little bit more than what we know of their you know, being together on the Sophie, the Polycrest, yeah. the Lively and Surprise. So we're going to talk about Narwhal Tusk yes. later on, and that that gives away that Jack in this timeline has spent some time cruising in the north in the Baltic and brought back the narwhal tusk for Stephen. So they've both had some other things going on in parallel in their lives. And if I do my history nerd bit, in terms of the real bits of chronology that Patrick O'Brien's borrowing, the previous book, you can estimate, must have wound up in about 1803, 1804. 
And we're now, if we look at the chronology of the, the Mauritius command itself, which was a real mission, that was 1809 to 1810. So in the world of the Napoleonic Wars, we've kind of the, the needle has jumped on the LP and we've got zip straight to 1809 and all kinds of stuff happened in the real world. Battle of Trafalgar happened, uh, all kinds of stuff on land and at sea against the French, against the Spanish, Admiral Villeneuve, Nelson, that's all in the past now. Right. And I wonder, and I guess we all must wonder a little bit, was that a deliberate thing by O'Brien? Or was he presuming that he might only have one or two books left to go and therefore he kind of skipped forward to get to some interesting new bit of time timeline i don't know but either way these four or so years have have gone by and we're going to try and pick up the pieces as we read the text about what's gone on and what situation Stephen and jack are now in well and and as much as i love patrick o'brien's writing i want to shake him by the collar and say give me those books back <laughs> there's so many great books yeah, that have been yeah, in here where did they go Ah. Oh man, yes, all the action and oh, and plenty of politicking to do as well. You know, there was stuff going on ashore, the, the British government changing, the yes. you know the political alliances in Europe changing. This was like peak Napoleonic, and it's almost silent for Patrick O'Brien. Right? I don't know. Maybe he was avoiding cliche. Maybe he thought everybody knows about what happened in eighteen o five. Great, thanks, Patrick. I, I don't know. I. I, certainly, everybody didn't know what happened to Ms. Williams, Sophie's mom. And <laughs> that also was a rude, like, oh, right. what? What are you talking about here? Yeah. How did we go from Mapes to her being ensconced in this small cabin? I don't get it. Right. I mean, the disappointment number one for character number one, Mrs. Williams. <laughs> Bless her. <laughs> Mrs. Williams had some kind of re- reversal. All of her, her money was taken by what she calls her man of business, her agent, her attorney, maybe. And the money's all gone and her house is gone and she's paying the mortgage with rent that she makes and she's living in a little cottage, this cottage mapes, with Jack and Sophie. They as a married couple. I think also with Cecilia, who is yes. uh, Sophie's niece yes but honestly mike if if you wanted to write a list of all the ways in which life ashore might disappoint jack cruelly <laughs> they're all there you know turn over the first two or three pages oh, and there's my like gosh oh man pet petty setback after petty setback for poor old jack right it's not 2020 but but we've got a, a an assortment of plagues here that you know that that starts to make us feel for jack here <laughs> yeah well i mean there's the personal loss i guess you could say that uh, stuck ashore on half pay he he at one point had quite a lot of his naval followers like killick ashore with him as servants and kind of householders and he's had to send them away he really misses killick in a strange way because killick's not the not the easiest person in the world to get along with jack is feeling a bit low that he's missing you know missing being on a ship he's skulking around this observatory with that he's moved so that he can look at the ship's in Spithead and spy on what's going on in the Navy. And he thinks his wife doesn't know, but of course, Sophie does know. Right. And you, you talked about plagues, Mike. There, there, there are plagues in the stall holding. Those the ca- cabbages and the cow and the small holding that Jack was dreaming about haven't quite worked out for Jack and Sophie just yet. No, cabbages are infested. Roses are leggy. Cow is dry. Beehives, <laughs> Stephen's gift to him, as we understand, have been destroyed by the fell wax moth. Yeah. Oh my! And and it was really I kind of I, I think I really had a hard time adjusting to all this change, and I missed Killick, and I missed Bonden, and I miss you know, and I was like, how did all this happen? I mean, I'm I'm used to these big upturns, but this was a really big, small personal upturn. It was, and I think it leaves you feeling a little bit flat. And like you, I think I've read similar accounts from people who say, you know, in reviews online, it was it just felt a little bit cold and a little bit less emotionally engaging at the beginning than the other novels did. And yeah. I don't know. What, what what did it take to get us going? I think you're right, Mike. Realizing that we're on course to meet some of the old shipmates, I think really helped. Yeah. I think you, you said that turning to the audio books rather than reading on the page helped you as well. Well, it did. It's funny because I, I just personally, with everything going on, I was reading this back on Kindle and not listening to audio. Yeah. And I, th- I think having the old shipmates show up, getting a little bit more of the Stephen Jack interaction of all, there was a little bit of that in chapter one, but then then it was followed as we'll talk about with a, a lot of kind of plotting and plot setting and, and setting the scene and everything. But 
when I got back to the audio books, it was like, ah, oh, okay, the voices are familiar. The tempo is back the same. Oh. Patrick Tall has, yeah. has warmed me back into the story a bit here. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. And we, I mean, we, we get quickly back into connections with interesting characters. And I don't think, let, let's wait and see. I don't think we're going to get to the end of Mauritius Command and think, nah. Oh, no. But it's certainly noticeable after all the, all the emotional highs and lows of Post Captain and Surprise that you, know, yeah. you start to miss that. Yeah, yeah. We had just this beautiful world. And sp- speaking of things that people missed, Mrs. Williams is missing her money, and this is something else that Jack's missing out on, <laughs> which contributes to the general air of not quite satisfaction. When Stephen suggests that maybe the next child they have could be a boy, <laughs> Jack says, oh, there's no likelihood of another. No, none at all. You've not been married, Stephen. Oh, I can't explain. I should never have mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. No, he's not getting any. Uh, no, he's not getting any, basically. And we know that Jack's a fairly, what you might call a red-blooded male. Right. So this is something that he was clearly hoping for that's missing from his life. And he's not desperate, I don't think, but he's a bit philosophical. He reflects on the fact that marriage hasn't had all of the sweetness and light in it that he might have hoped. There's a ni- nice passage where he's talking to Stephen. He says, the trouble is I'd got somehow the wrong notion of marriage. I had thought there was more friendship and confidence and unreserve in it than the case allows. I'm not criticizing Sophie in the least degree. So he's not saying things aren't great between me and Sophie, but he's saying, I realize that this situation of being together as a couple isn't quite the thing. Uh, I, I'm also not sure whether we're meant to read anything into the fact that Jack's Jack's mind is distracted <laughs> by the by the buxom figurehead of the frigate Bodicea that he sees either is it in his mind's eye or in his telescope? I think it's in his mind's eye. Um, the vast bosom spreading over the frigate's fine seaworthy bows. That's written about quite poetically by O'Brien, which means I think we're meant to pay attention to it. Yeah, it's it's funny because you have this notion of of things are not going well and and clearly jack you know uh, is is not completely happy although at the same time saying it's not sophie's fault i just had this wrong notion and and i wondered a little bit i know that sometimes we've heard o'brien talk so often about jack having been kind of part of the ship and then becoming a commander is now you know, isolated and he can, you know, nobody can speak to him unless he speaks and he's so remote. And so, you know, there's this great affiliation between everybody on board and then the captain. And I think he really thought this was going to be some more companionship. And I know so many times for guys, particularly, maybe, maybe this is a self-revelation. We talk about Patrick O'Brien's, there's that idea of, you know, being the knight in shining armor and going out to work and, you know, kind of going out in, in, in wooing females and everything else, Stephen's big plumage feathers and our spurs and everything. And then you want to get married and sort of come home and leave that behind. Oh my God, I don't have to keep yeah. making out to be all this stuff that, you know, but I, I don't see that here with Jack because, you know, Stephen's told us in an earlier book that Sophie loves kind of the, the other side of Jack, the not, she loves the captain Jack and the other side, but yeah, something definitely is not working here. And Jack has not got that, you know, that dear, sweet relationship that I think he dreamed about, albeit while saying that Sophie is still everything he thought she would be. It's just that marriage was not it. And O'Brien certainly has hinted a lot that marriage is not what anybody's going to expect yeah. it to be. We got lots of hints all the way through HMS Surprise and even earlier in the canon as well. Right. And he's clearly really happy and comforted that Stephen's come to visit. I think this was an unexpected oh. visit by Stephen. We, we don't know how long it was. Yes. But they fall into these very happy and candid conversations about each other and about what's going on. Right. And, and Jack's trying to show off his place to Stephen, you know, this place that he's dreamed about that's made him so happy. And he, he's trying to show it off. But but it's kind of a, I mean, it's, it's sort of a tough tour that, yeah. that, that Stephen goes on as Jack tries to explain how wonderful everything could be, might be, hope it will be, but it's really not now. Yeah. It's really not, and it, 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 it. Some of that comes out as funny, and but some of it's quite sort of downbeat. There's this line about the the, the grandfather clock, the, the tall case clock, which had to have its top left off because the cottage ceiling is so low, and this clock stood bareheaded in the corner, shedding desolation. 
Oh my gosh! Oh, you think well, everybody's disappointed? Everybody's disappointed, even the clock. <laughs> right, right. You know, and, and, you know, nothing seems to be working out farm wise. And then Stephen left alone as Jack goes off to talk to Sophie with Mrs. Williams. Mrs. Yeah. Williams, there. There's this tiny little cabin with the short roofs and short ceilings, and and Stephen goes to sit on this huge piece of furniture that that clearly has been brought from Mapes by Mrs. Williams, and Mrs. Williams says, "Don't sit on that," you know. Don't I, I go sit in Jack's chair? You know, don't sit on that. And Stephen tries to be polite, ask about the clock, and she says, "Oh, it keeps the best time in the county." Uh, and Stephen says, "Well, you know, let's set it to running." Oh no, no, we can't set it to running because then, then it'll wear out. It'll start to wear out. So, oh my gosh, you know, Jack, who's used to being the captain and being in control and giving orders, clearly mm-hmm. there's another captain in this cabin. It appears to me that really is. There's a whole other social contract going on in his family. Mm. And by the way, I was gradually warming up to this story, especially because Stephen is in good form. He was in such desperate yes. spirits at the end of HMS Prize. And whatever's gone on with Stephen, he's in great shape. He's A, he's funny. And B, he really nails what's going on here. He says he just philosophizes about what it is for sailors being ashore. He says, you know, sailors, after many years of unnatural cloistered life tend to regard the land as fiddle as green a perpetual holiday their expectations cannot be attempted to be fulfilled yeah <laughs> which is actually quite charitable he's saying it's not jack it's not a defect in jack there's no problem with jack and sophie it's just sailors and when sailors are at sea they're sailors and then when sailors come home to land they're a fish out of water so it's not nice of him a little bit i think to draw that as as slightly inevitable right and um, maybe he's comforting himself and comforting jack there you go. And I'm sure with some people whose relationships are built around a lot of travel, um, when you're home too long, maybe it's not quite as sweet. Yeah, re- relatable. <laughs> relatable. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking as two guys who travel all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Once exactly. Right, right. Oh. This whole idea of being slightly dissatisfied or disappointed, certainly from Jack's point of view and in the things that Jack says and observes upon, ends up carrying this theme with it that I thought I picked up anyway of a little bit of misogyny. There's a little bit of bah, women about some of the things that Jack says and about some of the things that we see in his observations and his behavior. Um, he is a little bit down on the fact that his daughters are girls. And I, I think he's expressing it in a way that says, I, I wish I could help them more. I could help them if they were boys. Yeah. But that's a point of departure that he's he's got daughters rather than sons. Well, Stephen sure calls him out on it that, you know, that you know, he calls yeah. him little swabs. <laughs> and seems like, you know, how come you're being so <laughs> negative to your girls, Jack? Right. And then when Stephen points out a good looking woman, when uh, Stephen and Jack are out in the, uh, in the crown for dinner, Jack really goes for it. He says, I have no use for your women, he says, handsome or otherwise. And I get the sense of so there's an unspoken battle of the sexes going on. When Jack reads out his list of ships that have been lost listed in the Gazette, Mrs. Williams sort of retaliates with her news of local childbirths and suffering and women's sacrifice. And Stephen really has to remind Jack, I think, of what he has with Sophie and that Maybe he should he should keep an eye on his his occasional references to his female astronomer friend. Yeah, yeah, he, he does right. Jack's going Miss, on and Miss on, Herschel. right? Yeah, and, and Stephen sort of catches up and says, "Allow me to pour you another glass of this port. It is an innocent wine, neither sophisticated nor muddy, which is rare in these parts." Now. Tell me, who is this Miss Herschel of whom you spoke with such warm approbation? <laughs> you know, O'Brien, I think, so often has references to wine. Uh, the gun, some of the gun room uh, listens will we'll talk about uh, how those wines often refer to women in the scene or refer to something else in the scene. And, you know, this sounds like uh, a great huh. description of Sophie here with, you know, this is not sophisticated, but not muddy. And that's pretty rare. And uh, of course, we we do find out that Miss mm-hmm. Herschel is much older and a mathematical minded and an astronomer. And, and it's something I think that Jack can relate to. And that was part of what came through to me. It's like, well, girls, you know, I would love them, except I'm not quite sure how to relate to them. I had this great romantic notion about marriage, but it's kind of not worked out to be practically quite that way. Same about my romantic notion about my cabin and small hold. And, you know, it's, he's having a tough <laughs> time. But, 
Yeah. But this mathematical woman with astronomy and, and helping him build his telescopes, that I can relate to. <laughs> it seems more like at sea yeah. again. Well, right. And if you want to talk about the symbolism of wine, you can talk about the symbolism of telescopes as well. Yeah, there you <laughs> but go. But I'm not going to go down. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, oh. Yeah, oh now, uh, to reflect one more time on this theme of, you know, women being harbingers of something that's not in, not entirely stable and comfortable for Jack, um, the the news of the inciting event, the the, the trigger that's going to set off the, the story of the new adventure comes from the visit <laughs> of another officer's wife, Lady Clonfort, married to captain of one of the frigates that's going to be in this mission that Jack is involved in, arrives with her own message coming ahead of her saying can i get a ride in your ship to go meet my husband and then she herself arrives to as she would put it to wait on jack and sophie all of this before any official news has reached jack and before also stevens had the chance to tell the little bit that he knows about the mission that's coming up yes too true and this driving stephen mm. crazy and for jack who has no notion that anything's coming up is like you know would i would i give you a ride in my ship sure if I ever get a ship, you can have a ride anytime you want. <laughs> no notion that he's going to have a ship here. But he's really excited. We get some idea of what that's going to mean to Jack when he talks about a broad pennant, a broad pennant, a Commodore's broad pennant. He's very, very excited. And we're going to have to delve into what that means in terms of naval hierarchy because it's a big step for someone at Jack's stage in his career. Yeah. I, I want to say, I, I, I spotted another little reference to the Dryden quote that we picked up a couple of episodes ago. Stephen's bemoaning the fact that intelligence is so lax and that people in general are talking about this mission, even though it's meant to be confidential. And he says, oh, we reinforce the Cape and we tell them so. So they instantly reinforce the Ile de France, that is to say Mauritius, and so it runs. All, all of a piece throughout. <laughs> which is a line a from the piece of Dryden. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, you know, some people have said, Ian, that one of the things that they did love, even though some of the beginning of this caught them up short a little bit, was that uh, O'Brien's dry humor is really front and center here. And I, I know that you saw some of those instances early on. Definitely. First of all, as our friend Jeremy said a few episodes ago, Stephen gets all the best jokes and he's right. absolutely the voice of these jokes. <laughs> And O'Brien's telling the jokes as well from the perspective of the narrator and just highlighting just how how naively hopeful Jack was and just how mundanely disappointing his life really is. So as they skirted the meager potatoes, the potatoes are indeed meager, as they skirted the meager potatoes, Jack pointed over their hedge and said, that is the cow. Ah, <gasps> I thought it must be a cow. Bit of, bit of sarcasm there from Stephen. I thought it must be a cow. Uh, for milk, I make no doubt. No, just so, just so. Vast, great quantities of milk, butter, cream, veal. That is to say, we look forward to them presently at the moment she happens to be dry. Yet, says Stephen, yet she does not look gravid, rather the reverse, indeed. Lean, pharaonic, cadaverous. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, and then we get back to Jack's favorite theme, which is that the yes. cow doesn't want anything to do with the bull. Yes. She's got nothing to say to him. You know, he's bellowing and tearing up the ground, and then we go without milk. <laughs> and so Stephen presumes in his very leg pulling way to lecture Jack. And I love this thing about what a hard life it is for a female, a cow in particular, but females in general, right. reflect upon the continual wearisome pregnancies, uh, the discomfort of a full udder. I do not mention the uneasiness of seeing one's offspring turned into a blanquette de veau because that's particular to the cow. But were I a female of any kind, I should beg to decline these general cares. I should certainly choose to remain dry. Yet it must be confessed that from a domestical point of view, celibacy in a cow takes on a different aspect entirely, says Stephen. Here, the general good calls out for teeming loins. Yes, said Jack. It does. <laughs> Ouch. Oh, and O'Brien's really loving telling this to us and it's lovely to drink it all in. It's really, really great writing. And he lands this this dry, sarcastic humor really well, doesn't he? He does every time, every time. Well, and, and we've kind of, we jumped a little bit ahead and a little bit back and everything here where we've gone through the farm, we've gone through uh, what's happened with Jack, not much with, about what's happened with Stephen, but Jack now is starting to get this inkling that something is about. And, and he's kind of like a little kid yeah. looking at Stephen. And Stephen, who is absolutely exasperated that this note should have come from Lady Clonfort, that 
all this stuff is going on. And Stephen finally has to break down and tell him. I think he's been, you know, Stephen saw him the day before. They had dinner together. He's seeing him now this day. And finally, okay, Stephen's been waiting for the official news to reach Jack. It has not come, but clearly the word is out already. Uh, Stephen has gone nuts about how loosely lips sink ships. But Stephen says to Jack, you know, in any other event, I should infinitely have preferred the news to reach you through the proper channels without the least explanation. Your provisional orders are at the Port Admiral's office this minute. For not only does this require speaking openly of what should not be mentioned at all, but I'm extremely adverse to appearing in the role of fairy godmother, a purely fortuitous fairy (laughs) godmother in this case. An Irish fairy godmother. Yeah, (laughs) too true. (laughs) Stephen says, It can inflict an apparent, though fallacious, burden of obligation and cause great damage to a relationship. Stephen is just, I don't want you to be looking to me or it's like, I've done this and I don't want any of your reaction. Jack, though, I I love Jack's, you know, is Jack's like, not to ours, brother, said Jack, not to ours. And I I will not thank you since you don't like it. But Lord, Stephen, I am a different man. And Brian says he was indeed taller, younger, pinker, his eyes blazing with life. <laughs> you know, and Stephen tries to tell him, All right, so you can't say anything to anybody. You can't mention this to Sophie. Jack's like, but I can start getting my sea chest right. No, no, you can't do any of that no, stuff. No, no. You know, everybody's going to realize you know about this before your order's coming. And Jack's going, a ship. <laughs> says there were tears in his eyes and Stephen <laughs> saw that he might wish to shake hands at any minute. If we remember Karen saying about all the <laughs> promiscuous handshaking here. Uh, Stephen said yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he disliked an effusion privately thinking the English far too much given to weeping and the flow of soul. He pursed his lips with a sour <laughs> expression and he put his hands behind his back. <laughs> now I'm thinking, oh, oh my God. God, we're back in familiar territory. I love reading <laughs> this. And, and immediately, Jack starts thinking about the new command and who all his captain's going to be, while Stephen is thinking longingly of lemurs. They're on Madagascar. Maybe they're in these islands of Mauritius and where I'll be going. Oh, so oh, we're yes. back to being Jack, familiar back to being again. Stephen. Yeah, I <laughs> love that. Now, we, we still have got a bit of this awkwardness. He's kept bubbling there. The arrival of Lady Clonfort. It's a classic piece of domestic situation comedy because <laughs> she arrives and she's 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 got an aristocratic title and she's trying hard in a very mannered way to deliver her little speech then not to look so fashionable as to outshine Sophie, but not right. so frumpy that she doesn't get the chance to charm the captain that she's going to go on the voyage with, she hopes. And Stephen's quite shocked, I think, <laughs> to see that the, the green eyes are forming Ooh. in Sophie. Uh, he had not, he says he long known that jealousy formed part of Sophie's character and was perhaps the only part that he could have wished otherwise, but he was grieved to see it displayed. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Sophie's clearly not entirely happy with this female. She's Not only has she got to deal with these occasional passing mentions of Miss Herschel and her telescope grinding. Right. Uh, yeah, she's grinding his telescope. That's what she's doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, <right. laughs> and, well, and Sophie's sitting there darning Jack's socks and Lady Conference says, well, you know, perhaps I could make myself useful during the voyage, darning his socks and helping with other things. And Sophie's <laughs> like, you're not helping my husband with other things. Let me tell yeah, you Yeah, can see right the thought about yeah, get your right. filthy hands off my husband's <laughs> Right, awful. But it's nice. Again, they're, they're, they, these are quite mature people in the end. And I like the fact that when Jack says, I'm going to have to leave soon, and Sophie sees that this is not her moment to to be grumpy and to, to play any kind of advantage, she sees that actually this is the thing that they've both all hoped for. She's going to put herself at a bit of a disadvantage if she pursues this slightly grumpy, yeah. dismissive attitude to the situation and to Lady Clonfort. You know, I like that Sophie, Jack's ready to leave immediately, and Sophie convinces him to spend the night. Yeah. And <laughs> but and Jack gives in. It's really good, uh, good observation that Sophie's reeled it back a little bit and says, well, you know, we're still husband and wife, and come right. on, baby, let's, you know. Let's enjoy our last night together. <laughs> well, I was, I was after after all the prequel to that. <laughs> They're on good terms, and there's this nice wrap up of the chapter from Jack. He says, "Tomorrow," looking fondly down. "Tomorrow, sweetheart, at the crack of dawn, you lose your husband to his natural element." Yes, which we think means the the sea. 
This sounds like a good moment for us to take a short break. So stay where you are and we'll be right back. Welcome back to The Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. Don't forget that you can stay in touch with us. Tell us what you're liking about the books. Tell us what you're liking about the podcast. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash lubber's hole. And you can follow us on Twitter at at whole lubbers. So join the story there. So Mike, we're we're on board of the Bodicea. I just want to start by talking about the ship we got a really big introduction to hms surprise in the last book and we talked about how the ship became a character we don't get a lot of description not at this early stage anyway about the character or the qualities of the bodicea we get relatively little about her crew actually we get some of the officers introduced to us but i think we're meant to get the feeling that she's not going to be a big part of jack's life in the way that Sophie was or in the way that HMS Surprise was and perhaps is still going to be. And just, you know, a means of getting from A to B. I don't know whether that meant that O'Brien thought, well, I'm I'm done characterizing ships and I'm not going to do that right now. Or is he thinking I'll I'll put the idea of the surprise as Jack's favorite. I'll put that to one side and bring it out later. What do you think? Yeah, it's it's a great question. And the whole kind of the whole nature of the book changes a little bit in that, as you were talking earlier, Ian, about this broad pendant, that it's not going to be Jack as captain of a ship, but Jack as a captain of captains, which I'm sure we'll talk about more. And so mm-hmm. maybe, you know, part of this interesting thing is he might not quite have a relationship with a ship the way he has in the past, at, at least as he's acting as, uh, as, as Commodore, as this broad pendant here. That's a really good point, isn't it? And therefore, his connection with the other captains is going to be more important to his success than his connection with the individual ship and its tactics. Right. I can see that being hard for him. I can see that being difficult for Jack, who loves drilling a crew, loves putting them through gunnery exercises. He clearly enjoyed working up the boat as a ship as they're doing their passage down the Atlantic. Um, He even managed to sneak in a bit of prize taking. Um, I, I love the fact as well that there was this little bit of action. It's reported quite indirectly in the way that O'Brien often reports action. We hear about it from Jack's official dispatch and also from his letter to Sophie. Um, as the uh, the Bodicea took this prize, the Hebe, um, off of the dry salvages, which are some small um, rocks and islands near the Canaries. And I also love that it wasn't a big, heroic fanfare of an action. Actually, it was a bit chaotic and a first lieutenant and his crew didn't really show themselves of, to be a, at a high mark of effective seamanship. And Jack himself did this slightly gerrymandering trick of hanging around until the right time of day when he could get salvage for retaking back the prize that this French ship had taken. But anyhow, imperfect and slightly offhand as it was, he's had some action, he's drilled the crew a little bit, and he's starting to mould them in the shape of the the ship's company that he'd like them to be. Yeah. And and finally, you know, we hear that, interestingly, after all this interaction with Lady Clonford, that he's at sea, does not have Lady Clonford. Earlier, we were kind of led to believe that there was sort of a a mistiming. He was going to pick her up in Plymouth. But now, Jack, in explaining some of what happened in the battle, also fills Stephen in on that, uh, or I guess Stephen fills us in, that that she was missed accidentally on purpose here. <laughs> so uh, that was an interesting aside. He kind of just you know left in the middle of the night, it sounds like, a little warning, ignored the lights going back and forth to shore and took off without her. You know, we've also seen Jack sort of getting back into his element a little bit here. We see Jack, the strategic captain, yeah. uh, as he sends off his dud lieutenant to take the prize away and uh, with him sends 
a lot of uh, the crew that he's not really happy with. And it, it, Brian writes that now with real <laughs> satisfaction, Jack watched eight sodomites, three notorious thieves, four men whose wits were quite astray, and a parcel of inveterate skulkers and sea lawyers go off for good. <laughs> and then a really, you know, this is this is when I'm also feeling like we're back into O'Brien. We're back into Jack. He gets to start to, even though we haven't heard much about the Bodicea, he is starting to craft yep. their people and the crew to be more like he wants to see them. So he, yeah, he so he's promoting the, the lieutenant who was d- deserving, but not blessed with any kind of favor or influence or patronage. And he gets to promote this relatively old master's mate to lieutenant. Yeah, I, I love that. Good old, the, the O'Brien egalitarianism and social mobility. Yeah, we love it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and this great little window into Jack's character here that Jack comes in, he, he calls in this lieutenant, this master's mate. He comes in and, and they've got these very deferential expressions on their face. And Jack's thinking, well, they, you know, maybe they're, it's my rank. Maybe they're used to the captain calling them in when they're going to get blamed for everybody else's mistakes. But in fact, in their minds, O'Brien tells us that they're thinking through the caca fuego. They're thinking through all these incredible actions and they've got this incredible yeah. respect for Jack and his naval actions. As O'Brien said, you know, he had very few equals among those of his standing on the Navy list in the minds of these people and in everybody else. But that Jack had no notion of this. Um, O'Brien writes about Jack. He sincerely regarded his more outstanding actions as the effect of luck. Mm. He had happened to be on the spot. And in his place, any other sea officer would have done the same. This was no false modesty. He had known officers by the score, good officers, excellent seamen, their courage beyond question, who'd served throughout the wars without any chance of distinguishing themselves, men on convoy duty, in transports, or even in the ships of the line perpetually blocking Brest and Toulon, who very often encountered danger, but from violence of the sea rather than from the enemy, and who remained therefore obscure, often unpromoted, always poor. Had they been in the right place at the right time, they would have done as well or better. It was a question of luck, O'Brien writes in Jack's mind. I can't imagine somebody's had all the success of Jack, somebody, you know, lucky Jack to really think, nope, I've just been blessed with yeah. being in the right place at the right time. And everybody, you know, I'm, I'm no better than anybody else. Wow. That's that's something. Yeah, that's that's the that's the thinking of a noble human being. It's very easy for us, isn't it, to yeah. to look at the things that have befallen us and go, yeah, 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 I did that, but actually, fate did it. <laughs> right, right. So we've got this nice happy time of Jack getting to know the crew and reflecting on himself a bit as well. We've got fair weather in the Atlantic. Last time they were in the Atlantic, they had gales in the Southern Ocean. So, But this time, right, right. I love that little detail of, of the purser for the new members of the crew nailing out 12 yards of white canvas duck and saying, there you go, make yourselves some fair weather white duck slops and hats. And this is part of the new crew members settling down to the nautical routine. And once again, O'Brien loves talking about the routine and the rhythm of days and weeks as they go by. Yeah. Oh, we we talked about music as well in our last episode, and I'd love that the, we we learn again that for some reason I don't know what it is about the flute, but <laughs> O'Brien equates O'Brien equates the playing of the flute with being actually socially rather unfortunate and less than okay. What somebody's talking about uh, that there was there was a surgeon in the Agamemnon that used to play green sleeves on his flute every evening, and every evening he broke down at the same place. And Harry Turnbull, our premier, used to turn pale as he got nearer and nearer to it. Oh no! So the, there's always somebody playing a flute who's who's the the antithesis of cultured, right feeling musicianship. And in, there's a little clue there, and I'm sure it's a deliberate one. There's a little clue there that Jack was aboard the Agamemnon which, by the way, was a real ship that Nelson was in command of for a while. I think we tweeted about that not long ago. Oh, you certainly did. And that was also where, yeah, that was also where uh, we had the first encounter of Jack a few career stages ago with this uh, officer, Lord Clonfort. But I think Mike, I think we might keep Lord Clonfort for a little while and maybe just keep thinking for a moment or two about Jack and the ship and the, the command as he gets closer to Cape Town. What do you think? 
you know, he's so eager and excited about this, but but at the same time, he's a little uncertain about it. What I love this phrase that he uses, Aubrey, about high command. He says, "High command is something you come to suddenly with no experience. Yeah. There are captains under you, and." each of them, God the Father on his own quarter deck. And it's a very different matter from handling a ship's company under your own eye. You can rarely choose them. You can rarely get rid of them. And if you don't handle them right, the squadron is inefficient and there's the devil to pay with tar. A good understanding is more important than I can tell you. Nelson could do it easy as kiss my hand. And I think it's a really good lesson and a common one in leadership that people who get to the point of leading other leaders are often really, really poorly prepared for it. Right, right. Everything that got you to that point was doing what you've always done. And now you're doing something completely different, you know, not just excelling at what you do. So this is this is a big step for Jack and and one that he loves on the one hand and is a little worried about on the other. He surely is. And, and also excited about the the hubris of being a Commodore, which, which is, yes. I think it's quite early in his career, to have made the step, but he's making the step. And he's relying on Stephen, isn't he? He's relying on Stephen yeah. to to sort of unburden himself too. And as we get further into Jack's thinking about the relationship he has with the other captains, I know that they become much freer talking about the other captains than Jack ever was talking with Stephen about members of the same ship's company. Yeah, because Stephen's clearly in a different role this time. He's He's not the ship's surgeon per se. He's really Jack's political advisor. He's an advisor to the future governor on Mauritius. He's, you know, he's really there in his other role. And so he's not part of the gun room. He's got a different mission and he can speak to Jack without uh, violating any of Stephen's principles, which are so strong. And that's a role that's really valued, I think. It always has been in terms of friendship, but here professionally, I think Stephen's really caring in a way for, for Jack and his mental health. Well, that's a great now, point too. I, yeah. <laughs> now, I, I want to talk about any parallels that you and I can dig up, Mike, uh, with the relationship between another famous captain and his surgeon. And maybe there are some parallels. That the, the captain I'm thinking of was first introduced to the public in the late 1960s, who became a worldwide cultural phenomenon, probably on an even greater scale than Jack Aubrey. I'm talking, of course, about James T. Kirk and his surgeon, Leonard H. Bones McCoy. Um, wow. Let's play a little scene of Captain Kirk and Surgeon McCoy. McCoy really looking after Kirk in what I think is a very Stephen-like way. Captain's log, supplemental. Now motionless for nine hours, 47 minutes. Can I get you something from the galley, sir? Coffee, at least? Thank you, Yolanda. Bring it to the bridge. I'll be there in a moment. Yes, sir. I wish I were in a long sea voyage somewhere. Not too much deck tennis, no frantic dancing, and no responsibility. Why me? I look around that bridge. I see the men waiting for me to make the next move. And Bones. What if I'm wrong? Captain, I don't, I don't really expect an answer. But I've got one. Something I seldom say to a customer, Jim. In this galaxy, there's a mathematical probability of three million Earth-type planets. And in all of the universe, three million million galaxies like this. And in all of that, and perhaps more, only one of each of us. Don't destroy the one named Kirk. Nice. You can you can almost see 
Stephen saying the same thing to Jack as as Bones has said yes. to James T. Kirk he's here so as he good. as he places his hand on Jack's you know heavy wound from his his most recent wound there. I love that. <laughs> now you might argue if you, I don't think you can make a direct connection from Bones McCoy to Maturin because I think Maturin, if you want to pursue it, is probably a compound of um, the Spock character and also McCoy the surgeon. No question about it, especially if you think about Spock wrestling with his half Vulcan, or let's read Enlightenment half, his half human, let's read Romantic side, uh, that and and the care and affection of of Bones together, we're, we're starting to get a lot of Stevenish kind of uh, interaction here with their captain. Kirk is the hubristic, sanguine, yes, uh, you know, outgoing, extroverted, em- emotionally demonstrative hero leader, and right. between them, McCoy and Spock are slightly grumpy and slightly introspective and slightly, <laughs> slightly thrown to poking, poking darts and jamming a spanner in the works in their own ways. I think it's great. Oh, now, well, I, I wonder. I, I wouldn't have thought that Patrick O'Brien, living um, in in a cave in a hillside in the Roussillon in France (laughs) would have a watched much TV B been likely to use TV as a cultural reference and C would never have gone anywhere near using an American TV sci-fi show as a cultural reference. But I think there are some parallels there. Yeah, which which may speak to both of them sort of looking at the human condition, certainly much more than O'Brien watching Star Trek. Yeah, I think so. And it probably speaks to the audience as well. Uh, yeah. Star Trek was famous, wasn't it, for being the, the popular TV show that surprised the networks by grabbing hold of the this very educated, very literate, very thoughtful sub-population, if you like, this very thoughtful demographic in the audience. And maybe that says that there was a, a, a thoughtful, intellectual, humanistic, observational tone, really, in society in the late 60s and early 70s. Two. Well, that, that and all the drugs, of course. Yep. <laughs> Too, too, too true on both accounts. Although I have to admit, they're part of the sixties. I can't recall, so I, 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 I can't speak to it. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> right. Now that Jack has managed to secure the help of of Stephen as his guide and counselor and confidant, um, he returns the favor a little bit and also gives us a bit of exposition by describing for Stephen as we sail into False Bay, which is the anchorage for Cape Town, pointing out the ships in this new squadron that Jack is still not yet in command of. Um, these are all real ships that took part in the Indian Ocean campaign of 1809. The Raisonnable, which is the, uh, the line of battleship, the two-decker, uh, the Sirius and the Nereid, which are both larger frigates. The Otter, which I think he describes as a ship sloop, which is the command of Captain uh, Lord Clonfort, which we'll come to later. And I, I liked a couple of setups that set us up for this chapter. Um, Jack gives a 17-gun salute to Admiral Bertie's flag. So we get the idea that people of flag rank get a salute and Jack is having to submit in his own right to a higher authority, which is Admiral Bertie. Mm. And secondly, we get the news that when Jack wants to go ashore, Jack's coxswain in the Bodicea is drunk and not able to step into his place, which is a pretty disgusting outcome, probably not that unfamiliar but in contrast with Bonden, right. who would have been by his side and would have been right there and would have been sober and proud and in great great physical shape and well turned out, ready to, to cox the captain's gig uh, ashore, this kind of really points out for us. The personnel aboard Bodicea are a bit of a disappointment to Jack, and he is a little bit bereft without people like Barrett Bonden with him. Yeah. He goes ashore, he gets his briefing from the Admiral, and it sounds like a very different kind of mission than we're used to. This is not a cutting out, this sort of daring, swashbuckling thing. But as as Stephen has related a little bit, there are these four heavy French frigates who have have reinforced the French presence there and who are snapping up India men left and right. So the Admiral's explaining to Jack that it's his job to deny those frigates the chance to harass the Oriental trade. Um, he has to put it British or Imperial boots on the ground on Mauritius. Um, and he has to either destroy the four French frigates or take their bases in Mauritius and Reunion away from them. That's, that's not an easy job. And Jack does not have great resources available to do that. And as you mentioned, he and Stephen are now talking a little bit more openly about characters. And Stephen's saying, look, 
this is going to be really important. You are dependent upon all the people around you. So let's make sure we understand where we are. And and Stephen says, so what do you think about Admiral Bertie? And, and I, I loved, you know, I think you pointed out, Ian, that he, he's got some concerns. He, he really has. The Admiral Bertie, although he's, I think he's an old contact or shipmate or colleague of Jack's from way back, and they're socially okay with each other, nothing remotely like the the beasting he used to get from Hart. Right. But he still has his reserve about just how closely behind him Admiral, Admiral Bertie will be. Jack says, as long as all goes well, I make no doubt he'll back us to the hilt. It's entirely in his interest. But if I made a mistake, I should not be surprised to be superseded, nor if I stood between him and a plum. And and Admiral Bertie himself kind of gives a hint that he'd really like to be made a baronet. He'd really like a little bit of a peerage and wouldn't Jack like one too. And Bertie's in this as much for his own interest as he is for the greater good. And Jack knows that he's not 100% dependable. It's striking. We hear about that in the same moments and in the same chapter as we hear about what's going on in the rest of the squadron. Because just as Jack had missed Bondon, we discover that Bondon and Killick and a couple of other followers were aboard the Nereid under the command of Captain Corbett. And Corbett is a a taught disciplinarian and a flogger. And we've come across commanders like that before. Lieutenant Parker in the Polycrest was a hard horse and a brass polisher and a flogger. Right, and right. Bondon's been given 50 lashes at the grating. Bond's been flogged the flesh off his back. And Bondon's an absolute steady, regular, sober, dutiful seaman. And he was flogged for not quite polishing the bronze on the on the locks on the cannons or something. And Jack is really, really upset by this. Flogged Bondon, cried Jack, going very red. Flogged my coxswain, by God. And we talked earlier on about how the opening of the novel is a little bit cold and sort of not quite as emotionally rich as the previous novels had been. By the time we, I got a really strong response in my heart, to, geez, that son of a bitch, you know. Right. <laughs> Bondon's absolutely the salt of the earth. But fortunately, so we, we get a resolution of one of those two setups. Um, Jack manages to exchange Killick and Bondon, sends Corbett a few of his own hard cases. He's doing a really nice job, is Jack, informing this crew, like you said. And so now that hang-up is resolved. And the other payoff comes as Admiral Bertie at long last grants Jack his pennant, or as you might say, pendant. I'm, I'm going to say pennant because I think that's the British way. Good. Grants Jack his pennant as a Commodore, which is yet more leg-pulling from Stephen. Well, it's, it, it, I, I wondered about that. Is this is this leg-pulling or not? But he's he, he Jack shows it off to Stephen because he's so thrilled about it. And, and, and I love the fact that... Uh, that you know, Jack has now gotten the word from the admiral. The admiral, who kind of threatened him a little bit too, saying, "You know, yeah, yeah, you were talking about you know the, you know, knighthood or something as possibility." But you know, the admiral had also threatened him a little bit, saying, "And and if you lose, you're on the beach for the rest of your life at half pay." Yeah. But you're the commodore. Here you go. And Jack's asked the bosun, "You know, do we happen to have this pendant?" Of- all right, help me to say this the right way, Ian. <laughs> I, I would say penance, but honestly, I don't think Penit. it's. A... <laughs> All right, yeah, I, I see it written both ways. I don't, I don't think we need. Any, I don't think we need any penantry here. <laughs> there you go. Be penantic. <laughs> All right. Oh, a pun! A pun! Oh, smoke that! They just smoke that. <laughs> so, Jack asked the person, "Do you happen to have one of these lying around?" And of course, no, you wouldn't happen to have one of these lying around. But in fact. They, the crew, had realized what they were heading towards the whole time, and they had been working the whole time and said they had had it made, especially for Jack, for the last 4,000 miles. Stephen had seen it in the bosun's office, and when Jack pulls it back out, Stephen recalls it. The ornamental cloth? Oh, that. Uh, I, I had understood you to say something new. That that cloth I saw daily in the bosun's cabinet when his bowels were disturbed long ago. I took it for a sign of his office or perhaps the banner of some bosun's guild. Sure, it will do us all great credit, the pretty thing. <laughs> Jack, so proud, saying, isn't my baby beautiful? And <laughs> Stephen yeah. saying, yeah, um, yeah, here's a, yeah. Here's a banana. I've seen a few babies. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, of all the babies I've seen, that's one of them, right? So this is a this is a temporary command. I mean, you know, I think lo- lots of us kind of pay attention to the the naval hierarchy and the connection that O'Brien has with the uh, 
the, the the real way that the historical navy went on. In fact, the idea of a commodore is still something that's in, in most most contemporary navies. Um, a ship in commission with a royal navy officer in command has a pennant which says, "I'm a commissioned warship." A ship that has a commodore aboard, who is a captain set temporarily above other captains, has a broader pennant. And I'll tweet out later on in the week um, some pictures of paintings that show a commodore's pennant. There's one from the War of 1812 that shows a commodore's pennant. And it's the symbol that people are saluting. And we get, therefore, we get this nice double payoff as the pennant is hoisted at the main aboard the Bodicea, the rest of the ships in the anchorage pay Jack the compliment, the deference due to his pennant, and he gets a 13-gun salute, which is yeah, just a great resolution of the, the 17 guns that we had just before. I love it. I love it. And that, that the best payoff of all is the Bonden good news and the pennant good news. Jack gets to enjoy them both together. So therefore, it was with his own coxswain at his side, therefore, that the Commodore put off for his tour of the squadron. This is like old times, Bonden, he said as they approached the Sirius. Yes, sir. Only better murmured Bonden, and then, in answer to the frigate's hail, he roared, Pennant! in a voice to wake the dead. <laughs> Love it. We've got Jack reunited with his old bosun. We've got Killick back on board, who seems, interestingly, even better, even better, or some people might think worse, <laughs> Killick, having served under this, uh, you know, this horrible situation. He's quite happy to be where he is. But we may have a little fly in the ointment. There's certain something a little bit bizarre. We've heard Jack thinking about the captains. It all depends on the captains. And there's this Lord Confort, whose wife, Lady Confort, Jack has accidentally on purpose not brought along with him. Jack, even before they got to the squadron, is talking to Stephen about the captains. And I think you had mentioned just earlier on the Agamemnon, that they had served together, Ian. And, and we hear a little bit about Jack's description to Stephen on that and what had happened there. We do. It's funny how cautious Jack is. He can be quite direct about describing people's character sometimes, especially when he's had a drink or two. And I think it's because he knows that this this good feeling, this band of brothers thing is going to be so important to him. He's very, very reluctant. There's a bit of wisdom from Jack Aubrey. He's not going to be too quick to criticize Clonfort, but we get in this kind of conversation with Stephen that they were both officers on the Agamemnon and Clonfort seemed to have taken credit for an action where he, Clonfort, had hung back and Jack had pressed on and taken the risk and more or less carried the day and that in dispatches it had ended up being Clonfort who was reported as having shown all the initiative and that hadn't ever really rankled deeply with Jack, but he's sort of aware and he doesn't really have 100% faith, I think, in Clonfort's character. And the doubt is in his mind because Clonfort went on to do some obviously very dashing and daring and creditable things um, in the campaign in the Middle East with Sir Sidney Smith. And he's willing, Jack is willing to give Clonfort the, the credit for that. Um, we also get the the psychology of Clonfort yeah. described a little bit by Clonfort's own surgeon, who is also Irish and is drunk in a bar and describes to Stephen just what a slightly messed up individual he is. He's a very insecure, you might say, preening character. And the thing that really shocked me, I think, and I think it shocked Jack as well, was when Jack summons all the captains to talk about how, how ready they are to undertake this command. And he asks them all to give a statement of condition. And Clonfort very naively, very kind of vaingloriously says, the sloop I have the honour to command is always ready to put to sea. Jack thinks, well, this is, this is really off colour. Everybody would like to be able to express that as a as an ambition, but he's asking a professional sailor for a realistic estimate of how much ammunition and water and repair work he still needs to take care of. And Clonfort dresses his barge crew in this Middle Eastern Turkish gown and cap way that is almost comical. And Jack really doesn't know what to make of him. Yeah, I'm amazed, as you said, that Jack's so lenient in his description of him the way he looks and, and interacts with the other captains here, uh, it's it's really different than anything. And, and then we get you had mentioned the narwhal tusk early on, and this is yeah. you know you know there's all these kind of social faux pas where Jack asks him to to sort of stay and have a drink with him or come back. Conference says no, no, I've had a previous engagement. You would never turn down your commodore. Jack's still trying to 
to do things. He walks over at one point to this narwhal tusk after Clanford has had another thing where he's kind of just left himself way out. And oh, not, not having coffee was Clonford's big, big oh, faux pas there. thank you. Him. Right. Yeah. And, and anytime there's a faux pas, it just seems to affect him so tremendously. And Jack is always trying to kind of yeah. rescue him and everything. You know, it's he says, this is an uncommonly fine tusk. And he remembers that he had brought a narwhal tusk back to Stephen back one time when Stephen was off being an intelligence agent. Jack was up in the Baltics. And Clonfort goes off into this incredible description. You you want to share that one? This story, which blew me away. (laughs) Well, he's talking about his campaign in in Palestine with Sir Sidney Smith. And he said, I believe horn is the proper term. It comes from a unicorn. Sir Sidney gave it to me. He shot the beast himself. And he then exposes himself to even more ridicule by saying, you can take your oath on it, sir. I cut it out of the creature's head myself. Yeah. And Jack's thinking, he's just exposing himself to ridicule. And it's a very strange, awkward, self-conscious showing off (laughs) that this character does. And he's a really fascinating character for that reason. For me, this is where I think the interesting, the character impetus of the story starts. You start to go, what's going on with this guy? And how is a real heart on the sleeve, tell it like it is person like Jack, going to try and command and corral and mollify and motivate a strange individual like Clonford and and also a, a rather brutal person like Corbett as well? Now, I think that... Although all the other characters in the story that the British officers are mostly um, representations of the people that played a part in this real campaign. So Admiral Bertie, Captain Corbett, Captain Pym, Colonel Keating are all more or less based on their real life equivalents. It seems, I think, that Clonfort was either made up for the sake of the story or perhaps was a sort of a compound of a sort of idealized, slightly e- e- extremified version of Thomas Cochrane, who was the <laughs> inspiration for Jack Aubrey. So you might even say that Clonfort is there to be the the sort of the anti-Jack Aubrey. Jack Aubrey turned up to 11 with all the self-awareness right, right. and all the honor kind of stripped away. Yeah, it, it really is. They keep, uh, and O'Brien weaves Cochran throughout the narrative here. And we've seen Jack kind of compared to him. Now we see Clonfort kind of compared to him. It is like these kind of weird multiverse version, different version, kind of different Being universe. Being followed around a set of a story by your alter ego. That's a really strange yeah. thing. I'm pretty sure there was a Star Trek episode where that happened as well, by the way. <laughs> oh, that's right. Wasn't there one where there was a bad Kirk and a good Kirk? There was. Oh my gosh, you're right. You're right. Oh no. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, this this analogy is going to be great. It's going to be the gift that keeps on giving. Now, I'm going to push the, the sort of psycho weirdness a bit further because we were in the 1970s and psycho weirdness is okay. I was wondering whether presenting this character of Clonfort to us, this is O'Brien doing a bit of either self-mockery or even confession. So just think about Clonfort. He's a bit of a faker. He has Irish or claims Irish connections. He's rather affected and wears his culture and his deep learning perhaps a bit ostentatiously he uses these rather overcultured french drawing room expressions like oh penetré i am penetré and he has a penchant for blurring fact and reality hmm wow. do we know anybody who claimed to have a unicorn of <laughs> irish ancestry but in fact had a narwhal tusk of an english mother ooh maybe maybe our author <laughs> Ouch. It's so fascinating here because it's so very different from, I think, anything we've seen in the novels up until now. And and at the same time that we've got this Clonfort, Clonfort has his own surgeon who Matron is talking to. And it, even the two of them seem, you know, variations, Scottish versus Irish there. Um, yeah. you know, different approaches. They seem to be competing with each other a little bit, completing for Clonfort's attention sometimes. It's it's really interesting. You might also say, I'm going really rolling with it now, in that we have three different versions of what you might call the caricature of Irish character between Maturin and McAdam and Clonfort. We have the slight, slightly effete, tale-telling, fictionalizing bard in Clonfort, and we have the really slight, grumpy, philosophical, self-destroying as it happens, drunk Macadam, and we have the anxious, inwardly turmoil-ridden 
uh, philosophical thinker and reflector on the world, Maturin. And those are probably, you know, three different Irish authors all in one box. Oh, wow. <laughs> Too true. Mm. So I, I want to make one more connection, Mike, because I think it might help us to point ourselves in the direction of what might be going to happen with Clonfort. I want to make the connection between Clonfort and James Dillon. Mm. He, t- tell me what you think of this. So back in Master and Commander in the first novel, Jack had fellow officers, including Dylan and also Pullings, who, who along with him valued personal honour. And it came up as a theme in the book that it was about honour and demonstrating and pursuing honour. And the officers that are around Jack are many of them showing signs of dishonour, I think you might say, from Jack's point of view. Right. So Corbett is the brutalizer of an honest crew and the brutalizer of, of Barrett Bonden. Admiral Bertie is a weak, vacillating commander. He's done some vaguely shabby things in the way he treated the Russian sloop that's kind of trapped in uh, uh, in Cape Town. Clonfort is a bit of a self-regarding dilettante who cherishes the name of honour, but seems to be very willing to surrender his own integrity in this in the pursuit of, a, of an attractive untruth. So by Aubrey's definition, you can say these are all dishonourable. And the only other character that we've had in Jack's past who had an honour fetish was James Dillon, <laughs> who was also Irish, by the way. And, and that didn't turn out. And he really well. resented Jack. It didn't turn out so great, did he? Bit of a self-destructive end for James Dillon. Is the same thing going to happen here? Wow. Can Stephen, in his role as the chorus and observer character, help Jack to come to terms with comfort more successfully than he did with Dillon, I wonder? Yeah, I think this is something we've got to be looking for. Uh, as we keep going forward so. in the Mauritius Command. I think we do. So maybe we should uh, say next time, just just one more time, Mike, we should perhaps have a little bit more. Patrick O'Brien, what do you say? Oh, with all my heart. We're off a ship's biscuit for another day. Happy days. (laughs)